morning, bonjour, uh, buenos dias uh, a tout le monde, regardless of where you might be. Um, we welcome you to this um, event that um, we hope will be able to elucidate, I'm sure, questions that you may have about um, the, the purpose of um, a lecture such as this one. I am not the person who is um, scheduled to introduce uh, our esteemed lecturer. Um, however, I will begin um, this event um, and give the floor to those who will follow me. Um, the first um, um, element that we have, the first agenda item that we have for you is a welcome um, video by the Director General of the FAO. So please sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, agri-food systems lay at the heart of the sustainable agriculture and rural development. They are essential for the reduction of the poverty and the inequality and the promotion of the health dance globally. We must work together to, in the face of enormous global crisis to support the transformation of agri-food systems. This is at the core of the FN's new strategy framework 2022 to 2031. It is our priority duty to support the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals through the transformation to more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. This four matters reflect the interconnections necessary for an effective transformation. The law and the use of international legal instruments have an essential role to play in supporting this transformation. And an integrated approach to food security also includes legal reform. National policy are important political instrument, but the legislation anchors the food security in national legal framework and holds government accountable to their international commitments. FO is committed to supporting members develop the required legal and policy framework to support this transformation. And to continue support efforts to promote the food security and the poverty elimination through national legislation. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the passing of the laws and the legal frameworks were critical to mitigate the impact of trade and the movement restriction, especially on smallholder farmers. Legal framework strengthen the political will needed now more than ever before, as the world build back better. And they provide the necessary support to ensure that the COVID-19 recovery sets all the countries on the path to meet the sustainable demand goals by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the Director General's video message has set us on the right footing. Um, just a quick point of logistics, I would like to um, invite you, if need be, to use the interpretation services that we have made available for you. At the bottom of your screen, there should be an icon that um, represents a globe that says interpretation. And if you click on it, you can choose the channel you prefer in English or Spanish. I will now um, cede the floor to the independent chair person of the FAO Council, um, Mr. Hans Hugewind. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, our actions are our future. That's the slogan of World Food Day this year. 76 years after the foundation of the Food and, Agri Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Transformative change we certainly need, and we need it urgently. The dots don't connect anymore. We are bringing tourists into space. But at the same time, it's a more outcry that we have more than 800 billion people living in hunger. We have 3 billion people having no access or not enough access to safe, affordable, and nutritious food. And we have 2 billion people with obesity. 
let's not forget we are also losing one third of our Jewish food yearly, which is one trillion US dollar in economic sense. Think of what you can do with one trillion US dollar. We're also deeply concerned by the rapidly accelerating pace and impact of global climate change, which, if not corrected promptly, will lead to unprecedented collective failure that threatens the future of our planet. We as member states and stakeholders have became champions of setting targets and goals. And last week, we set again targets and goals in Kogui, China. But there are no champions when it comes to implementation of those goals and targets. Let's not forget we are less than nine years away from 2030, where we have committed ourselves to implement the sustainable development goals. And indeed, as Dr. Chu said, we need more sustainable active food systems and healthy diets to win our fight against worldwide hunger, leaving nobody behind. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there's also a message of hope. The crises are made, so we can solve them. Three weeks ago, we had the United Nations Food Systems Summit. It's for the first time since decades that we were discussing agri food systems and healthy diets at the highest level within the UN. And our heads of states, our CEOs, our heads of organizations, our heads of NGOs made a clear commitment to have transformative change. So we have to use this momentum. We have to translate words into action, swords into plowsers. That's the words of the statue at the headquarters in New York. But political commitments should be clearly translated in clear international and legal law systems. Law and use of international legal instruments have to play an essential role in the transformative change we need. Of course, we need a strong, strong political commitment. We need accountability, and we get that via legal systems. We also need legal systems for the living environment to get more investments we desperately need. Legal frameworks have to go hand in hand with a wide range of financial instruments and techniques, especially to increase the investments of the private sector and international organizations. Excellencies, do we dare? Do we dare bring our legal systems and our legal frameworks to the 2.0 or perhaps even 3.0 level? We have seen successful examples in the past. For example, the Treaty on Planting and Resources for Food and Agriculture. But over the last decades, I have witnessed a growing interest in voluntary guidelines. Are these tools we need nowadays? This year, I was able to chair the negotiations on the voluntary guidelines for food systems and healthy diets. We succeeded after 350 hours in two months of virtual negotiations, we got them. And this week, we were celebrating the adoption and the implementation. And all member states said they are committed to implement, but none of the member states put it in the national legal frameworks. So we cannot keep anybody accountable for implementation, and they cannot be invoked in the court. By nature, they are voluntary. So is this a real commitment we made? Is this a sort of change we are seeking? Questions for press for this afternoon. And again, we see a message of hope. Based on the recent court rulings in the Netherlands, not only governments, but also companies are being held accountable for meeting climate change with Dutch markets. And they, that ruling was also based on international rights to life and the right to an underdeveloped family life. Do we dare follow this example and translate voluntary guidelines into our national law systems? Because we need it. We need accountability. We need the enabling environment. We are celebrating World Food Day. And if we really want to face our challenges related to food insecurity, if we really dare, if we really care about 800 million people in hunger, why not formalize right to food as a formal international human right 
and implemented in our national legal systems, which can be invoked in court. Ladies and gentlemen, would that not be a real change in history? Need transformative and progressive change. Do we really care? Do we really dare make the leaving nobody behind a reality? Our actions, our future, our legal frameworks, our foundation for our future. Thank you. Do not have looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ICC. And uh, firstly, I would like to welcome everybody, wish everyone a very happy World Food Day. The ICC has very ably uh, set the stage for this lecture, highlighting the challenges we face, um, and also the tools that we could maybe use to try and address some of those challenges. Uh, firstly, you will probably have noticed we're having a technical glitch. Unfortunately, Professor Eccles, whose institute, the World Food Law Institute, in fact, is the convener of this annual lecture, is, and is not joining, has not joined us yet. Um, we sincerely hope that she will be able to join her. Nevertheless, in her absence, I, I wish to thank her for the privilege of being able to deliver this lecture. I'd also like to thank, of course, my colleagues who have made this happen. Um, this Jocelyn Brown Hall, director of the FAO North American Liaison Office, as well as her team, and most importantly as well, the Development Law Service of the Fowl Legal Office. Now, as I noted, the ICC, the Independent Chairperson of the Council, has set the stage. And so we begin. As the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization has said, agri-food systems lie at the heart of sustainable development. But what are agri-food systems? The FAO governing bodies have applied the following definition, and I quote, the agri-food system covers the journey of food from farm to table, including when it is grown, fished, harvested, processed, packaged, transported, distributed, traded, bought, prepared, eaten, and disposed of. It also encompasses non-food products that also constitute livelihoods and all of the people, as well as the activities, investments, and choices that play a part in getting us these food and agricultural products. As you can see, the agri-food system is broad, but it is not working as it should. This has been highlighted, as I'm sure many of you listening today have noticed, by the COVID pandemic. The current outlook on food security is grim. And indeed, according to the 2021 report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world, and here again I quote, nearly one in three people in the world, 2.37 billion, did not have access to adequate food in 2020. An increase of almost 320 million people in just one year. Consequently, as the independent chairperson of the council noted, this is a matter of urgency and it is a matter that needs to be addressed in, in, through all mechanisms that are available. And today I intend to illustrate how laws at each stage of the supply chain can support better agri-food systems. And by contrast, how the absence of laws can undermine agri-food systems. The pandemic affected the entire agri-food supply chain from the farm to the ultimate con consumer. It has led to restrictions on movements of workers, changes in consumption choices and options, the shutdown of food production and processing facilities, and place severe financial pressures on the food supply chain and indeed on national budgets. Most countries have had to revise or indeed create new legal instruments which address the current emergency and those that would arise in the future. The pandemic though has also shown us how actions, including legislative actions, to support better agri-food systems must operate at many levels, internationally, nationally, and locally, very locally. They also have demonstrated that legal instruments and government structures, be they multilateral, national or local, must address both public and private actors. So turning to the law, what is the law? Well, even before King Hammurabi developed the Code of Hammurabi in 1760 BC, setting the law for ancient Mesopotamia, people subjected themselves to rules that would allow order in social and economic interactions. Ancient Egyptian law 
dating as far back as 3000 BC, was embedded in the values of social equality and impartiality as well as tradition. Therefore, law is at the core of our lives as members of a community. It regulates human relations and it organizes life within a society around certain values that society shares and wishes to promote, such as human rights, which could include the right to adequate food as the independent chairperson of the council said. Laws are fundamental drivers for change. They can set standards for desirable conduct and deter undesirable conduct. They can establish responsibilities, rights and entitlements, procedures, incentives and sanctions for both individuals and for institutions. And as such, I argue that law and regulations are vital to build strong agri-food systems. And I will now try and demonstrate my hypothesis. My first hypothesis is that law can establish the fundamental principles and rights on which agri-food systems should be built. A sustainable agri-food system is one that delivers food security and nutrition for all in a sustainable manner. This includes the development and implementation of conservation and management measures. International laws relating to fisheries provide a good illustration in this regard. Many of you will be aware of IUU fishing, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. This threatens marine ecosystems because it undermines national and regional efforts to manage fisheries sustainably. And the Agreement on Port State Measures, the PSMA, is the first binding international agreement that specifically targets IUU fishing. It lays down measures for parties to apply when foreign vessels enter their ports and seek entry into ports or while they're in their ports. And as more and more countries have actually ratified the PSMA, the gaps which allow illegal fishers to bring illegitimate catch to market have narrowed. And the PSMA requires countries to have robust legal and institutional frameworks, including mechanisms for prosecuting IUU offenders, as well as technology for cooperation and information exchange. And one good example of the PSMA's beneficial effect can be taken from Thailand, which has effectively used the PSMA legal framework to monitor fishing vessels. According to its Department of Fisheries, Thailand is the third largest exporter of fishery and seafood products in the world, accounting for around 8% of total world exports. The fishery sector contributes 3.2 billion euro to Thailand's GDP, and it supports the livelihoods of approximately 2 million people working in the industry, ranging from small fishing villages to large scale exporters. In 2018, using the PM PSMA framework through the information exchange procedures established under that treaty, Thailand was able to identify and refuse entry into its ports of 46 containers carrying fish suspected of being caught illegally and thereby protecting its producers and its market. Another international law example is the International Plant Protection Convention, the IPPC. And this treaty aims to protect cultivated and wild plants by preventing the introduction and spread of pests. It controls transboundary movements of plants and plant products. And so while many of you may not be aware of this, at the international level, you are protected by ISPM 15. This is a standard which uh, is established under the IPPC framework for wood packaging. And it makes sure that every pallet, every box, every bit of wooden packaging that is used to ship goods, in fact, is free from pests. So that when they cross continents, they do so in a manner which is consistent with safe and sustainable agri-food systems. This international instrument is applied through national legal instruments. So the ISPM 15 mark is registered under national intellectual property laws. And laws are also used to establish the institutions that need to provide the entry and spread of plant pests. So, for example, we have a law on plant health, which was recently adopted in the Maldives, supporting the establishment of a national plant protection agency. And very recently, draft laws have been developed by countries as diverse as Nicaragua and the Bahamas, and similar processes are ongoing in Fiji and Mongolia. Due to time constraints, I, I won't address soft law instruments, such as those mentioned by the Independent Chairperson Council. However, I would underline they are very, very important in fostering harmonization of national laws to strengthen agri-food systems. Turning to my second hypothesis, this is that law can provide a guiding framework that coordinates and drives change across agri-food systems. 
And in this context, I would argue, national constitutions offer the highest form of legal protection, be they written or unwritten, they enshrine the basic principles to which the state and society must conform. They can compel transition, which would assist and strengthen sustainability in agri-food systems. They can also establish fundamental rights, which do not have to be limited to those rights which are traditionally, traditionally recognized as human rights. And so, for example, and I think many of you will find this interesting, I did anyway, the 2015 Constitution of Nepal recognizes the right to adequate food, the right to be free from hunger, and the right to food sovereignty. It also recognized the right for every citizen to live in a clean and healthy environment. Similarly, the 2009 Constitution of Bolivia recognizes the right of everyone to water and food, and it establishes an obligation on the state to guarantee food security by means of healthy, adequate and sufficient food. These countries have shown that important steps can be taken in recognizing that sustainable agri-food systems are key to their sustainable development. And the potential effectiveness of having a constitutional provision is illustrated by one case from South Africa. In the case uh, World Wildlife Fund South Africa versus the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and others, WWF South Africa invokes the provisions of the South African constitution that establish the right of everyone to, quote, have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations through reasonable legislative and other methods. And the WWF alleged that the Department of Agriculture had unlawfully set an allowable catch quota for West Coast rock lobster at an unsustainable le level, thus undermining the long-term survival of the species and threatening the livelihood of the fishes who depend upon that. And the High Court of South Africa concluded that the quotas did indeed threaten the environmental rights codified in the Constitution of South Africa. The Constitution therefore provided a basis for stakeholders to challenge decisions that they considered undermined the sustainability of the agri-food system. While constitutions reflect the highest laws of the land, framework laws, sometimes referred to as organic or orientation laws, are also very helpful in setting objectives, principles, rights and obligations, particularly those related to agri-food systems. And here I turn to another example in Africa. From Tanzania, the framework law of Zanzibar is, I believe, a good example. And there, the Food Security and Nutrition Act establishes that, quote, the government has an obligation to facilitate accessibility of right to food to every person through maintaining the right to have continuous access to the resources that will enable someone to produce, earn, or purchase enough food, not only to prevent hunger, but also to ensure health and well being. This act then specifically attributes responsibilities to various ministries, trade, livestock, fisheries, social welfare, health, disaster management, among others. It requires the establishment of a food reserve, and the sands of our food reserve, identifies how this will be resourced. It also establishes an obligation on the government of Zanzibar to provide and maintain sustainable food systems and the protection of the right to food from encroachment by any public authority or any person. And indeed, it goes so far as to establish criminal penalties for any person or officer who breaches the provisions establishing government obligations on the right to food. So as illustrated by this Zanzibari law, framework laws can bring together and coordinate multiple sectors to support agri-food systems. My third hypothesis is that sectoral laws can bring about positive transformation of agri-food systems. And you will remember that the definition of agri-food systems covers the journey of food from farm to table. It covers not only how food is produced, but how it's prepared and eaten and disposed of. Agri-food systems can, I believe, be made stronger through specific legislation, including through measures that protect the most vulnerable. Thus, Belize, for example, recently completed the development of a contract farming law that will facilitate the introduction of written and fair contracts for important commodities, such as the pineapple. And turning to the other end of the supply chain, there are laws addressing the school environment. Now this truly, I'm sure you agree, can transform lives. And by way of example, I point to Ecuador. Their legislation on school feeding defines the rights and entitlements of school children. It determines institutional responsibilities 
and it ensures coordination among different stakeholders. It ensures also budget allocation and provides a framework for monitoring and enforcement. The Republic of Korea has a School Meals Act of 2006, which in fact even goes beyond the provision of nutritious school meals and obliges schools to establish healthy eating habits amongst young people. In addition, legislation can address cultural contexts. For example, in 2005, Japan enacted the basic law on food education. In addition to promoting food education, the law aims to protect traditional Japanese culture. And it does this by seeking to promote the revitalization of agricultural, mountain and fishing villages and improving Japan's food self-sufficiency. Self National and local governments are required to adopt measures to promote traditional and regional food cultures. And then moving away from say, these more, uh, the, the matters which um, and back to the beginning of, of the supply chain, I would turn to specific legislation uh, pointing to production. And in this context, I'd refer to the antimicrobial resistance efforts to address this. And AMR, this refers to the ability of bacteria to develop genes that are resistant to many existing antimicrobials, such as antibiotics. And the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials in animal and crop production have in this day and age created major risks for human, animal and environmental health. Now the work in this area is very new. It is, however, thankfully progressing rapidly. And for example, in Zimbabwe, with the support of FAO, the revision of a veterinary medicinal products regulation has been undertaken, and this will prohibit the sale of antimicrobials without prescription, so as to prevent the overuse of, antimicro of, of antimicrobials and the consequent development of AMR by making it impossible just to buy these over the counter without prescription. So sectoral laws can regulate the rights of obligations of various acts in agri-food system, their activities, as well as their political, economic, social, cultural, and institutional environment. And in so doing, they strengthen agri-food systems themselves. So far, though, I've focused on the positive, the positive uh, where there are laws at international and national levels um, and their contribution to strengthening agri-food systems. However, I think to really understand or appreciate the impact, the transformative impact of laws, uh, you can look to the impact of the absence of them or the absence of the capacity to enforce them. And unfortunately, regrettably, the COVID-19 pandemic has given many, many examples of this. And I refer in this particular instance to the Supply Chain Risk Insights Report of 2021, which noted that food shortages and high demand of food had led to an increase in food fraud. And this report concluded that the countries particularly affected, and here I quote, frequently have gaps in legislation and enforcement that weaken the ability to detect and seize fake food. Clearly, this is a matter of concern for every single one of us as we all consume food. And then looking at a very different impact of COVID-19, e-commerce provides an interesting example. According to an OECD brief on e-commerce in the time of COVID-19, there were, quote, shifts towards e-commerce have been observed in several countries, in particular along the food supply chain, including farmers who started using digital technologies to sell their produce directly to consumers, or restaurants that switched to providing food or grocery delivery services. However, most food safety laws are not equipped to address e-commerce. For example, few countries have provisions addressing the liability of third-party platforms on which food may be sold. It's interesting to hear to look to China, which has some of the world's most comprehensive e-commerce laws. Nevertheless, according to some reports, from 2017 to the first half of 2020, 45% of the 49,000 e-commerce disputes were related to food products. As a consequence, in October 2020, the Judicial Committee of the Supreme People's Court passed an interpretation related to the application of food, uh, of, 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 of food safety rules in civil cases. And this interpretation confirmed that, in addition to food producers and business operators, e-commerce operators are also liable for food safety issues related to the products on their platforms. So in this case, potential gaps have been addressed through judicial interpretation. However, for countries where there is no legislative regulation of e-commerce or limited regulation of e-commerce, 
efforts to address sales on digital platforms will always be much more difficult. So in conclusion, my premise, the premise of this lecture is that law at every level can transform uh, for agri-food systems. And while not only the mechanisms available, laws are critical to support a transformation to a more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems with a view to achieving better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. And these are the goals embedded in FAO's strategic framework. And so today, as we celebrate World Food Day, as well as the International Day of Rural Women, it is, I believe, appropriate to consider how laws can help us to achieve these goals. I thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. I will um, cede the floor to Marsha Eccles, the founding executive director of the World Food Law Institute, um, which organized this event. Um, Marsha. Your, I think you're, you're still on mute, perfect. Now. Thank you very, very much. And um, I thank you everyone for your patience, but more for joining our special event today. Uh, as you know, we have tried to organize this program to celebrate uh, World Food Day, but also our annual World Food Law Institute uh, lecture. And we were very, very anxious to have the legal advisor present this year's lecture, which she has done amazingly well. And we thank her very, very much for that. Just um, quickly, uh, I would like to say a little bit about the World Food Law Institute and how this lecture, our collaboration with FAO and others has helped to promote our goal of making the public aware, more aware of legal uh, policies and trends related to food that are important for development, developing countries, SMEs, and, and are certainly the provision of food security around the world. So I thank um, the legal advisor for her wonderful comments. Um, I thank the ICC for his uh, introduction also. Um, he was a panelist at our symposium last year and certainly helped us to think, he encouraged us to think of law more and lawyers more in a positive way and our ability to create and foster change that is useful and uh, helpful for our social lives, for our economic lives, um, for development. But he certainly encouraged lawyers to be more uh, creative and active. And I think that the lecture that you have just heard gives you examples of how law um, legal institutions and lawyers have been able to help us create transformative change, which we certainly hope for. Um, I would certainly like to say that this program is an example of uh, something that we have wanted to do for many months, and that is to bring together our institute in Washington, DC, uh, our lecture, one of the events that we host each year, and FAO um, in a program that combines many different voices and perspectives. So the wide, the wide participation, our participation of, it sounds as if hundreds of uh, participants today certainly helps us promote our goal of providing interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, international discussions of food law uh, issues. Since I think uh, we have translators for a limited amount of time, I would like to, to some extent, just limit my remarks, um, which would have been a little uh, longer for the, if 
I had been able to uh, present an actual welcome. But please accept these comments uh, as our welcome from the World Food Law Institute. Um, our chairperson um, who with me and an international executive uh, created the Institute to promote events just like today's and our future collaborations that we will look forward to. So thank you very, very much Legal Advisor. Thank you very much ICC and everyone who has helped to make this possible and successful. I look forward to your questions and the discussion um, at the end of the Q&A session. And certainly I hope that you will uh, remember the World Food Law Institute in Washington, DC. Our goals are uh, promotion of interdisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary international discussions of food law and policy issues and trends. So um, I think I would stop there uh, so that there will be adequate time for questions and answers before the translator's um, time has, has expired. So um, maybe we could go on from now. Uh, I think that um, some of the specialists from FAO are monitoring the chat box. And so perhaps we could find um, some of the questions that have been proposed. Um, any, let's see. Um, and I would say questions or comments. Um, So I, I can actually um, try and, and bring a question to um, the attention of Donata. If there are questions for the ICC or for the WFLI, um, of course, please bring, bring them to the chat and uh, we will pass it on to them. So this is the question. Um, I would like to ask regarding the first mentioned cases of constitutional amendments um, to include the right to food, and or the right to a clean and um, safe environment in the law, um, the examples of Bolivia and Nepal. Um, so the question is the following, what other mechanisms are required to make sure that these constitutional rights are actively protected? Such as the example in South Africa, activism was key in that case. But if governments enact these constitutional protections, what should they be doing to make sure that they are actually upheld? Thank you, thank you. And indeed, I'd uh, noticed that uh, query watching the chat, and it's, I think it's, it's such a pertinent question um, because yes, uh, a constitution without uh, mechanisms to, to implement and apply is, is, is a, a grand piece of paper and, 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 and not much more. Um, and yes, as you had indicated, in that case, you, you had uh, the WWF, which has a function of sort of trying to advance environmental goals. Um, I would say, and I think most of the legislation that we have looked at, um, you require to have in built in your legislation, firstly, administration institutions that can actually take action, that can monitor, that can enforce. You also need to have resources because an institution without resources to monitor, to enforce, and to, to actually say implement those requirements is, is without teeth. And of course, thirdly, you need understanding and knowledge of, 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 of how to access justice. Many people, those who actually need this constitutional protection um, are those who in fact are probably the least best placed to actually uh, secure justice. Um, and it, so therefore I would say, in the context of these institutions, in the context of resources, you also need to be raising the capacity of people than of the, um, to, to know and understand how to access, uh, access justice so that they can enforce these rights. Of course, these rights have to be translated from a purely legal perspective. The rights have to be translated into you know, regulations, uh, ordinances, right down to the most local level um, to make them a reality. 
but that, so there's no sort of one single answer, but I think there are, there are a lot of answers. But as a constitution, because it is the supreme law of the land, every single actor somehow plays a role in advancing that. And so, yes, non-governmental organizations play an important role. Schools play an important role. Universities play an important role. Lawyers play an important role. Politicians play an important role. Um, but uh, so, it's, so it's, it's a combination of everything, but at least having that, that constitutional provision gives a hook that people can use to make sure that these fundamental values are, are enshrined and must be and can be enforced. Uh, I hope I hope that uh, answers answers your query. I did also want to mention that uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm very grateful for the for, for many of the comments um, that that were made, and indeed we would be happy to make make the lecture available um, in, in in writing in written form. Um, thank you. Uh, back back to you, Kisney. Thank you very much, Donata. Um, I don't know whether Marsha has any questions that she would like to to pose. I see another interesting one in the in the um, in the chat. Should I go ahead, Marsha? Okay. So, how is FAO working with other UN sister agencies to advocate for the leveraging of legal and regulatory frameworks as tools for transforming food systems? Thank you. Um, yes, we, I mean, we work very closely, as you can imagine, not only with our sister agencies, but with other IGOs as well. Um, but what we try and do is we, and, and this is, I think, common uh, in the UN system, is that we actually all try to see where our sort of added value comes. And so, for example, uh, in recent past, and I did see one of our colleagues from, uh, from the institution is here, from IDLO, we began collaborating in the context of activities addressing, say, COVID-19. Um, and so they bring their rule of law perspective and we bring our technical knowledge of food law. Um, with UNIDRA, we're doing a huge amount of work, um, particularly on contract farming. Nowadays, we're, we're actually working very actively on institutions for you know, legal forms for agricultural investment uh, with the intention of trying to develop guidance uh, that could be used that enables, say, even the smallest agricultural producer to find a form of legal uh, establishment that will then in turn give them access to, for example, credit uh, to, to markets uh, in a much more sustainable and safe way, uh, a, a sustainable and secure way. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of engagement with the WHO, of course, we work extremely closely because of the One Health approach that we take. And indeed, uh, the ICC is very familiar with all the work that we are doing on One Health uh, with OIE as well, um, because no single institution in the UN system can address these matters alone. Um, we need to have that sort of comprehensive framework, uh, and we need to also understand that we're not in competition with each other. Um, but there is a huge amount of, of, of very practical technical work happening as well, not only just at headquarters level, but also at country level. Uh, you will see, you know, we have, we have in, in FAO, I believe it's 90 or so offices outside headquarters, um, and uh, they work closely with their counterparts, be it UNESCO on, you know, education promotion of, uh, of, 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 of information in schools, be it uh, health matters, be it, uh, you know, labor rights, uh, you know, this, this, is, this, is how, this is how we work in, 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 in that context. So all sorts of uh, mechanisms going. And then of course, in the governing bodies, there are, you know, the, the, the definition of policies um, are endorsed by the bodies uh, and here I believe the ICC would be a better place to, to, to speak, but uh, what uh, many instruments which are recognized say in the FAO are also governing bodies are also then endorsed or recognized in others. And indeed I believe the, in the AMR Global Plan, uh, Plan of Action, um, that has been endorsed you know, not only in the UN, um, also in FAO and also in WHO as a way of leveraging our respective uh, constituents, uh, you know, the, the capacities of our respective con constituencies in, in, in this context. Um, I, I did wonder. Well, I, I, I apologize, but may I ask a question? I, I muted before. Based on your experience, and as we think about change, uh, transformative change, is the change more likely at 
international, national, or local level? Or have you seen a, a difference? Gosh, it asked me a very, very difficult question here. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer that question because yes, change goes at different paces, but I think one always has to, to recognize the starting point for change at national level will always depend upon the national priorities and national government. And so, you know, great advances can be made on certain issues, as has been reflected, say, on some climate change activities, climate change related activities, if that is a national priority. At international level, I mean, here indeed, I wonder whether the ICC might like to, to comment because uh, you know, he has his, his vast experience, not only as an ambassador, um, but also as a chair of the program committee of FAO and now as the ICC. And so uh, as far as whether change is fast at the international level, I believe he would be, be better placed. But my, my simple answer is that it, it, there, there, there is no easy answer. Sometimes these go step by step, you know, international action will move national action more quickly. National action um, sometimes comes together, coalesces in a way that it then influences, it, it demonstrates an international consensus. Um, but maybe Hans, I, I, I don't know if you would have. Uh... Yeah, thank you very much, Donata. And I think, of, of course, what we need, of course, is implementation and change, transformative change at the national level. Where the action has to happen. But I think the strength of the United Nations and the international rule of law is that we can only get all that change done if it's supported by action at the global level. We have to support, especially, of course, development as well as would be Africa, Gulag, or Asia. We have to support them with, I would say, legal structures, legal frameworks to make sure, and with, of course, the financial tools and instruments to make sure that they can implement at the national level action in the legal frameworks and an action on the ground. And that is what you're seeing with the Treaty on Planet Genetic Resources. You've seen it with AMR. But my plea, of course, is I see a tendency to go to voluntary guidelines. And voluntary guidelines, guidelines are great because it's a negotiated out which we need. It was a clear plea also at the Food System Summit. And when it becomes voluntary guidelines, now, I don't see many governments putting the voluntary guidelines into, into their legal systems. So how strong is then their commitment? And what we need for transformative change and progressive change is much more commitment. And we'll get it if it's done via legal systems at national level, because then it can be involved also in court if governments are not responsible and not, are not accountable. And I think that's the strength that we need. But I always think we need support at the global level to make things happen at the national level, and especially hopefully via fire legal frames, because then that gives us strength and visibility and accountability. And as I said before, not only for governments, but also for the private sector. It gives them an environment which makes sure that they are going to invest in those countries. Thank you very much, ICC. Uh, I know from your participation in our symposium last year that your comments are always uh, very, very thoughtful and helpful. Um, Kisseline, I think that we are about at 10.30 and I leave it to you to say whether we can continue with translation or whether this is the point at which we uh, switch off. Thank you very much, Marsha. And indeed, um, we are coming to the point of this meeting where the, we are losing our interpretation services. Um, however, we had anticipated that and um, went ahead and extended um, the time together by about 30 minutes or so for an informal dialogue. Um, so I will leave it to you, Marsha, to um, close the event formally but to invite um, those who are on the chat to stay on for a little bit longer if they can. Um, I know that both the ICC and the legal counsel are themselves very busy, but they might be able to give us a few minutes of their time.
Um, so we will close formally, but leave the chat open for another 30 minutes, understanding that we will be um, having this conversation in English without interpretation at this point. Thank you very much, Kiselin. And I would like to say, I hope before uh, we have lost the translations that um, the interpretation that I thank you so very, very much for those of you who uh, joined the program today, but more than anything else, I thank the legal counsel for her wonderful remarks and for accepting our outreach, our invitation to be the lecturer for this year's World Food Law Institute event. And thank you for helping to make it possible in this, again, interdisciplinary uh, international fashion. Thank you very, very much. I also thank the ICC for joining us again. Um, your remarks are always welcome and helpful. So thank you for that. And I would just like to say that um, I will be thinking about the remarks today uh, as we consider how to move forward. What next? Um, what are some of the issues uh, that might be possible uh, areas for our focus? And that is why I asked the, the last question. So thank you very, very much, uh, legal advisor. Thank you very much, ICC. Uh, thank you to everyone who has participated uh, in the event today. And I'm sure that it was successful long before I joined it. And uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, for those of you who are uh, staying on, please uh, be willing to continue with your questions, your comments and we will try to continue the discussion in English for um, another you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, for part of that time, I, possibly with the legal advisor and the ICC, we will just have to see. So thank you very, very much. We uh, have, I guess, just say thank you for this very, very special day, special event. And um, I look forward to the comments and questions to come. I just want to interject very quickly and say that um, the interpretation services um, have been extended um, to the end of the hour. So those who may have been discouraged thinking they would not be able to um, understand, please stay on. Well, thank you very much. So maybe we could go back to the chat and um, to any comments or questions. Um, and maybe as we're going forward, since the legal advisor and the ICC are still on, if you do have any comments to add, or uh, perhaps we could do that also. In fact, Marsha, if I, if I may, um, I, I, I wanted, in fact, to thank um, those who have presented some really interesting information and questions in the chat. I saw, for example, there was a, um, information about a, a, a matter in Ireland. Um, it's really helpful to, to, in fact, this is how we learn. This is how we keep our, our thinking going. So, you know, we, we, we will be um, rapidly taking little notes as, as, as we go along. And one, one of the questions, um, if we have a, a few minutes, that caught my eye was about customary law. And I, that uh, is, is a matter sort of dear to, to my heart, I have to say, because customary law forms the basis for so many of the, of the sort of the, of norms, practices, rights and obligations in many, many countries, um, sitting there alongside statutory law and not always to, uh, achieving the, say, the recognition uh, and the, of, of the power that it actually has. Um, and, uh, and indeed is sometimes maybe uh, dismissed uh, unduly, uh, which I believe is a mistake because these are laws and norms that many, many have in fact followed for many years, um, uh, for, for their lives, for many generations. And indeed in that, in that context, um, I believe some of my colleagues are on, on, on line here today uh, who are working specifically on a program which is looking at uh, customary law, uh, customary law in the context of trying to uh, address uh, wild wild meat conservation and uh, sustainability. And uh, in that regard, there is a, a, a very specific recognition that you need 
to actually look at and understand the components of customary law. You need to look at the systems for dispute settlement under customary law. You need to understand um, the, the, the mechanisms by which rights, be they tenure rights, the right to use forest products and non-forest products, um, so that because without that understanding and that recognition of those systems, um, you are not going to be addressing the full picture. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I welcome seeing, seeing that query and I, I did just want to interject on, on that point. Thank you. Back to you. Well, I thank you. And perhaps um, I asked about international, national, local, and maybe that sh I should add a fourth category, customary. Uh, and there are many persons in countries that are following customary, customary law to them, um, even if it is not written into statutes. So, um, another question or comment? Um, let's see, Kiseline, do you have, are you selecting um, something? It is true that many of the questions that were asked in the chat that um, have been um, touched upon by um, our colleagues. Um, one question that came up was, how can I apply laws of, um, on protection? How can I apply laws of protection food system and make it high, highly efficient in different countries with different food systems? So um, how do the laws of, that apply to one, one context can benefit other contexts when it comes to um, food systems. Um, again, I may I may share this with uh, with with the, with the ICC. <laughs> um, I would. I mean, my first answer is there is no one size fits all. Um, yes, you know sometimes model laws are adopted and developed, but in every single case, uh, a law needs to actually be designed for the setting in which it is intended to operate. So one can identify good practice, which is what I tried to do um, in, 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 in my lecture. Um, and indeed what the, the development law service of FAO consistently does, identify what may be good practice, but at the same time, you need to actually look at everything that surrounds the food system within that particular country. Because, um, you know, to take the obvious example, um, a country which is not greatly involved in e-commerce, for example, uh, would not need to have maybe the complexity of, 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 of laws regulating food safety in the context of e-commerce than a country which has huge e-commerce activities. Um, and there would be, in fact, it would be counterproductive because you might then create a huge institutional or administrative structures, um, which in turn cost money, but which in fact are not necessary. So it's, there is no one size fits all. But I think what we try and do, and this through, say, the voluntary guidelines that, uh, that the ICC was mentioning, um, as well as uh, guides and, 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 and other, and other uh, documents, we try and identify what can be done. Um, but then it is for each country to actually design it. Um, and for that, I would also say that our approach is very much that for legislation to be effective, for legislation to truly understand the situation in country, all stakeholders must indeed be consulted. You know, it's not a question of you know someone sitting in a government office alone to decide to, to design legislation. There is a need for consultation. You know, with the businesses that would be affected, with the communities that would be affected, with the with with the individuals that would be affected, uh, so that you can take into account the needs of all to create the legislative framework that you need to advance food systems. Um, and you know, as, as uh, I think, this is this this applies to all legislation. You know, I've worked in different places where we've tried to do that, but I think it applies even more in the case of food and food systems, because this affects absolutely everybody in different ways, be it as a producer, a distributor, a supplier, a consumer, etc. So you know, you need to have that very that the laws. Um, which say guarantee or safeguard um, uh, agri-food systems need to really be designed in the context of the framework uh, the, of, the, of the, the, the economic, social, cultural, historical setting in which a country uh, is, is, is to be found. Uh, thank you. Over. So I don't know whether the ICC wanted to chime in. Um, if not, I will 
I think so. Well, I can be, I can very agree because I fully agree with what was said by uh, Donata, and I think that's the strength if you develop an international level voluntary guidance, and I hope even more strong legal framework. Of course, they have to be general to make sure that they can be implemented in all the countries of the United Nations. And then the strength, of course, comes if it's translated at the national level in accordance with the national priorities, national circumstances, and that was said also very well by Donata, national circumstances can differ from country to country, also when it comes to cultural backgrounds, etc. And then the strength again is if you then have a translated at the national level and we learn from it and you bring the good practices to the national level, you can further strengthen it again, the next step of the implementation. So I think it's an interaction between the international and the national level for, uh, legal frameworks. And I think that's what we try to do. And sometimes we have great successes, and sometimes we see that we are not there yet, like with the right to food. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ICC. I, I see another um, question that I think might be interesting, given that um, the legal office is right now looking into this, is the the role of data protection and digital technologies in shaping food security and agriculture. Um, so um, I will I will let you answer that. Um, I have to say I, I don't feel particularly well qualified to answer that. Um, it is because it is it, it's a highly specialized field. Um, we you know there for example I could point to the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which is looking very, very carefully, addressing very, very carefully these matters, the, 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 the rights, uh, in, in fact, providing sort of access to certain genetic resources and trying at the international legal level to ensure that there is access and benefit sharing. Um, so, you know, data protection IP plays a huge, huge role in that, in that context. Um, we uh, I also, are aware of uh, other treaties. I mean, there are sort of UN, U, UNEP uh, administered treaties, which are also relevant in, in, in the sort of more data protection intellectual property field. At this moment in time, uh, the FAO legal office is not working as such on, on guidance in, in, in this regard. So I have to, I, I would be wary about saying too much because I don't want to say something wrong. Um, but it is, it is, yes, without doubt, hugely important and particularly as you know, our, our food supply, our food systems grow more global, um, you know, and protections um, and the recognition of rights are, are, are hugely important, um, and uh, and to, with a view to uh, avoiding abuse or, or exploitation inappropriately. Um, but uh, with that, I mean, if you if you would like to provide an email address, I'm sure that we would be able to after the lecture uh, share sort of some sources that we that we have. Um, that, that maybe you could find of interest and of assistance. So, thank you. Thank you, Donata. Um, any, indeed, um, I think there was at least one participant who asked whether we could share additional resources um, um, that would be related to the to some of the the hypotheses that have been made in the lecture. So this is something that I think we could certainly try and do. Um, there is another question here. Um, how does the law work um, to implement ideas related to climate change? What are the challenges and factors that are affecting um, the implementation um, and if its effectiveness? So how the law works to implement ideas or initiatives related to climate change? What are the challenges and the factors? Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, that uh, the, the, this query is one which is very, very, um, very, very topical. <laughs> so I don't need to, to say that to, to those around the, the screen at the moment. Um, and indeed, um, there is a lot of work ongoing in this regard at the moment. Most of it um, is, is still sort of at the developments, very much at the development stage conceptually. Um, there are very few countries which have implemented, say, climate change laws specifically to address food and agriculture. And yet, you know, as has been recognized, I mean, say in the Coronavia process, um, that food and agriculture, addressing food and agriculture will be essential for climate change. And indeed, many countries, NDCs, uh, also have highlighted the importance of, say, climate smart agriculture, 
with a view to um, at, at addressing their climate change challenges and global climate change challenges. But to, to be effective, um, and I'm afraid here again, I sort of return back to say my, my, my response to, to an earlier question. To be effective, you need to actually first review what you have in your law, um, because some laws, uh, some countries have gaps. Some countries have laws which maybe could achieve climate, uh, climate, uh, uh, climate change uh, objectives, um, but need, say, some form of uh, uh, adjustment. Um, other laws, no doubt, would need to be heavily revised because they, in fact, are counter to sort of the needs of, of, of the globe right now. Um, in order to be effective, like any piece of legislation, I mean, you need institutions, you need resources, you need, you need uh, you have regulations that, that are actually implemented and are enforceable. Um, but in the context of climate change, it is very, very tricky because again, when we look at that whole supply chain, um, the whole agri-food system, you're dealing with not only land tenure questions, um, you're dealing with also you know, your, your, your production questions, um, you're dealing with your distribution questions, you're dealing all, all the way, um, all, all across the food supply chain. And so it, it, it isn't easy, but as I said, you know, we have begun analysis um, and we, we hope to begin um, being much more active, but we've, begun, we've already begun analysis addressing, you know, adaptation, mitigation measures that could be taken in the context of food and agriculture across the different sectors, you know, because it's not just livestock that you need to address, you know, it's also the questions of fisheries are relevant, which I have to say, until we began that research, I wasn't aware of, but uh, right across the spectrum, consumer laws need to be addressed. Um, so, so climate change, effective laws to address climate change in food and agriculture are a priority, but they are not easy, and they would require a huge amount of political will just um, from governments, um, precisely because of their very complexity. Um, and, you, know, the, you, you need real dedication to be looking at that, in, 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 you know, with, you know and, to, and to be addressing them, and, and, and a real need to be ready to transform, um, you know, because in some, for some sectors, it is what it is likely there will need to be quite significant transformation. Uh, thank you. Over. There was one question or comment in the chat that um, made me think about the impact of the laws and um, the food and agriculture sector on different segments of the community. So the question was about women and trees and tenure, I think. Um, but women and youth have been two of the constituencies, groups that have become, um, I guess we, we always try to think of laws and policies that might um, address the concerns and needs of both of them. So I wondered if you, if there might be a comment about either what FAO is doing, for example, um, with some specific projects or programs uh, legally that might help either group, youth or women. And I also ask that because our first World Food Law Lecture was presented by the Nobel laureate Wangari Mathai, who talked about forest and food. So again, the whole idea of trees and food and, and different ways of, of finding uh, food security, promoting food security and secure livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha. Yes, so you're, you're quite right. Um, you know, at the moment, there is a particular focus in, in, in the work of FAO on uh, youth and women. Um, and also, indeed, specifically uh, rural youth, there is at the moment uh, under the, uh, the, 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 the careful guidance of, uh, of, of the ICC, uh, the finalization of a rural youth action plan. Um, and with respect to women, we have um, from the governing bodies, we already have some of the endorsement of the importance of addressing particularly the needs of, of vulnerable uh, communities and specifically um, and vulnerable sections of the population and particularly women. Uh, women are, you know, some of the world's that, so a large number of the world's producers of food. Um, they are also those who, 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 who need food to feed not only themselves, but their children. And so there is a focus on these. Within the context of our legislation uh, work, 
there um, we, in the context of designing or assisting mem uh, our member nations to design their legislation, we would also always do an analysis of the impact, say, on women and how can we help women within that framework. And again, this may this I mean, the, the, the actual recommendation for action will differ from sector to sector and country to country. You know, um, you know, some some regions, some countries, you have say large a large number of say women fisher folk, and there. In, in the, as, as, as reflected in many of our uh, voluntary guidelines, etc., we then address the needs of that particular community in our recommendations. So that's how we try and the, and, and and ensure that uh, communities that maybe need that extra that extra recognition and extra support are actually addressed within the context of laws. They would also be engaged, of course, uh, representative groups would also be engaged in consultations around national laws. Uh, whenever we work with an individual country uh, that is in the, that is, uh, has requested our assistance to develop legislation, um, multi-stakeholder consultations are for us an essential part of the process. And that includes those who would be most impacted by the legislation. Um, so that's quite a generic answer, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, again, we could point you to a, a lot of the guidance that we have actually developed in that context of how do you mainstream some of these major challenges that we face and that countries face and that communities within countries face so that the law actually works for the entire, <laughs> the entire nation. Uh, um, that, that, you know, for us, that is, that is essential. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Masha. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I wondered if um, the ICC has a comment he would like to make to help us conclude. Uh, and before uh, we, I think, give the final word to uh, the legal advisor. Thank you very much. And first of all, I think I would like to compliment you, Marsha, and uh, I would say the Football Institute for having these discussions and certainly listening to Renata uh, it's always very, not only joy to work with her, but our insights also to see how we can make the recommendations much more strong to be implemented in the national legal framework. For example, when it comes to gender, the position of uh, women and girls that are not far, one of the most difficult issues we negotiated when it comes to the voluntary guidelines. And we still see huge differences in the information at the national level. Because only if we give them a strong, if we translate it in legal frameworks, we can give women and girls access to land and access to financing. Because if we only, and of course, the, level can, the international level can only make recommendations, but we have to do our utmost to convince those countries to put the legal structure so that it will happen on the ground. And as long as we keep on pushing, perhaps, we get step by step forward. And that's why we need that strong legal discussion uh, so that we not only speak about political commitments, but we try to translate it in much more stronger commitments via international and national legal frameworks. And I think that the shared goal to not, and I have from different positions within the FBO organization, but I think that's the only way forward we really want to achieve sustainable food system and health and diet. And we're really optimistic that we can do it. We are getting nearer, but again, we are not yet far enough. Thank you. I thank you also. Um, Donata. Well, thank you. I, thank you, Marsha, and thank you to the Institute, firstly, for, for providing this forum, which brings us together once a year to, 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 to exchange thoughts and views and to learn from each other. I've, I've learned a lot uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, the, in this session. And um, I, I would like to take the opportunity uh, also to, to, to thank the, the ICC, with whom I, we, we work a lot on other things, but so this is the first time that I think on these sort of issues that we've, uh, we've worked, we've collaborated closely and it has been a, a true pleasure. Um, and of course the team who, are, who, who have been helping us uh, arrange this. But most importantly, I really would like to thank those who have taken the time uh, to join us and to be here today and to think about what we're saying um, and maybe just to leave with a plea that maybe from this, Please don't stop this conversation. Please have this conversation with others. And please be a champion of legislation and law 
to promote secure food systems, sustainable agri-food systems. I think this is this is essential um, because th this this needs everybody's engagement. And those who are here, you know, have so much knowledge. I can see from the comments that they said, and they would be the most important advocates uh, globally for really solid agri-food systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, goodbye. Thank you very much, Donata. And um, I would say also thank you to all of the participants. Uh, perhaps this um, could be the start of the network that I've had in mind for many years, um, a legal network to continue discussions like this on a particular topic. So perhaps we can think about that as we go forward. And I want to thank uh, Kiseling also for all that she has done to help make this successful and uh, pull this program together. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, we at the World Food Law Institute are honored to have been involved in this to make, help to make it possible. And we look forward to um, continuing collaborations and uh, programs together. So thank you again. Thank you, Donata. Thank you, ICC. Um, and thank you very, very much for to the attendees from around the world for your participation, for your questions. And I certainly look forward to hearing um, any comments or suggestions from you as we go forward. This does not have to stop right now, as Donata said. So let us think about how we might keep the discussion going forward. Certainly, we will consider them as we plan our roundtables, uh, which we hold perhaps every quarter, um, and the symposium, which we will um, hold with FAO. Um, in next year. So uh, we think we will think forward, um, but certainly I would welcome your ideas and your questions as we go forward. And thank you to those who have made this possible through your interpretations. Um, and thank you for staying over.